que sea inclusión diferenciada, porque claramente no hay una exclusión de las mujeres por estas tres categorías que he presentado, sino que estamos incluidas diferenciadamente. Uh -huh. So, in this sense, the problem that uh, indigenous women face, I propose, is not to talk about exclusion and inclusion as uh, liberal culture often does, but to talk about differentiated categories of inclusion, because we are not technically excluded, we are just included in differentiated ways. En ese sentido, un horizonte de igualación propio de la cultura liberal y centrado en sujetos abstractos y no de personas concretas que conservan bienes colectivos este, resulta siendo este, primera vacía y segundo eh, contraveniente contra la lucha política por uh, defender la tierra comunal. So in this horizon of equality that uh, talks about abstract subjects and not of concrete people that uh, work and own goods is really counterproductive for the struggle um, to defend the lands. Eh, en ese sentido la pregunta movilizadora la, pro, la pregunta académica movilizadora pero también la pregunta política para mí es cómo transformamos este, este formato de reproducción sin perder el control de la tierra comunal cómo transmitimos la herencia comunal de la tierra sin que sea únicamente los apellidos patrimoniales quienes lo aseguran aquí está So, in this sense, the question, the mobilizing question, that it's not only for academics but also politically, is um, how to transform this format of reproduction without losing the control of communal land and how to transmit the inheritance of communal land without being only through patrilineal names that can uh, secure those lands. No es que se busque un proceso por derechos de la igualación entre hombres y mujeres porque el proceso de igualación de hombres y mujeres significaría eh, la partición de las tierras comunales, convertirlas en propiedad privada y convertirnos en pequeños propietarios, sino más bien el interés es ampliar los términos de uso más allá del parentesco. So, very important. So, when we are talking about this horizon of equality um, and trying to think about men and women, being uh, equals in this process, that's not what we're talking about because then we would be splitting men from women like we're splitting the land and, and becoming private property owners. Uh, but instead is to expand the notion of the use so that it goes beyond the basis of marriage. Tampoco se trata de establecer y crear una estructura de autoridad exclusivamente femenina que mimetice el modelo de autoridad masculina dominante y que quiera desechar la presencia de los apellidos masculinos, porque son los apellidos masculinos el, eh, la estructura que limita la propiedad privada. All right, so also, um, it is about establishing and creating a structure of authority that it, uh, it's not also not about establishing or creating a structure of authority that is exclusively uh, feminine and that discards the um, male uh, last names, but um, to... Uh, Mm, oh yeah, but because but instead to find the, the limits against private property. Bueno, y voy a finalizar con interrogantes que quizás podemos conversar más adelante. Eh, las interrogantes que complementan mi investigación académica y política son las siguientes. ¿Cómo, y digamos es la pregunta política, cómo transformamos sin perder lo que tenemos? ¿Y qué significa ampliar los términos de uso de la tierra comunal al mismo tiempo que seguimos, cuida seguimos cuidando que el Estado no se presente como autoridad con capacidad de decisión sobre las tierras comunales? Ok, so I finally wanted to end just with a question that have always complemented my political and academic research and I think that the political question is how do we transform without losing what we have and what does it mean to expand the terms of the use of communitarian land at the same time as we are, uh, continue to take care of it and protect it from the state 
uh, and not as an uh, authority with the capacity of decision of the, over our communal lands. Bueno, y quiero finalizar diciendo que, que el antagonismo histórico de la formación del Estado versus lo comunitario se revela de manera capilar en el momento de pensar cómo se transmite la herencia comunal en primera. Y en segunda es que yo estoy ensayando junto y alimentado con posiciones como la de Silvia Federici o la de Saba Mahmoud o de Fariba Matenka de hacer un análisis del, del cercamiento, en el caso de Federici, del cercamiento de tierras comunales desde el punto de vista de las mujeres, eh, lo cual no significa un horizonte de los derechos por la igualación, sino que yo planteo un horizonte de los deseos y que a más adelante en el texto aparece este, una serie de deseos movilizadores de las mujeres que se presentan en términos de no perder y no partir la tierra comunal para ella, para sus hijos y para sus hijos. Es únicamente. Muchas gracias. Para So, in terms of this historical antagonism, we want, and my, uh, I want to address two main points. The first is how to transmit this inheritance and the land. And the other one is to follow uh, Federice, Mahmoud, Montenka, uh, who think about the land differently, but particularly Federici, who speaks about the enclosures, and not as a horizon of equality, but what I wanted to propose later in this paper is about desire and the mobilizing desires on how to not split the land and to also not lose it. And so the first point that I want to make is why I admire them so much, and it's because of their scholarship activism intersection. To be a, a Maya scholar inevitably leads you to activism. Um, and their work has been very important to shape the state of Guatemala, the laws of Guatemala, and the struggles of resistance in Guatemala, not only for indigenous peoples, but to rethink the state. Large, right? So a lot of what they do is an uncommon thing uh, outside of Latin America. Uh, these expert witness reports right, that Ima talked about. Uh, scholars have to explain to the state and to the courts what does it mean to be indigenous, what collective land, you know, territory, not individual property, but what territory is about. So when Maya lawyers go to court to defend women's rights, and water rights to defend territory, they have to explain to the court, to these very colonial courts, what indigenous is all about. And so their role is really important. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and so one of the things I wanted to pose there um, is that these Maya scholars are activists in that they're permanently translating epistemologies and translating uh, political spaces, right? And bringing Maya politics, indigenous politics into being within the state system. Uh, and it's a major challenge and it's a beautiful thing to see when you see that play. And I've been in Guatemala the last couple of months and it's been a huge blessing for me to see how you are transforming the state from within. Um, so I'll leave it an open. Um, since this is about scholarship and activism, can indigenous scholars not be activists? And what does it mean to be an indigenous scholar? This privilege we have, what do we do with it? Um, 
I'll make a couple of maybe three main points uh, and one on academia and activism. So the first point from Irma's presentation, very emotional and powerful. The crimes against humanity that she describes um, against women in the 80s, are they over? Are the, are the times of civil war over? If indigenous territories are still being stolen, if indigenous peoples are still being taken to court, um, there are hundreds, and we don't know how many. I kept asking people that is including how many indigenous activists have been jailed unjustly. We don't know the numbers, but it's a huge amount. And so, crimes are fabricated, accusations are fabricated, and people are jailed on um, preventive, preventive jail, preventive prison without a trial. Rigoberto uh, Juarez, Domingo Baltazar, Oscar Sanchez, and of course, all of these peoples are at the situations of war. All of these communities are still at war. So the official war is over. Right? The military camps are over, but now the military camps of the 80s are being replaced by hydroelectric projects. And maybe the war is less fought on women's bodies, but it is still fought on indigenous bodies. Mm -hmm. So is, are these crimes against humanity part of the past, or does the war continue? And I would say um, there was a class here at UMass taught uh, by my native colleagues called Conquest by Law. And the colonization by law in Guatemala continues to happen on a daily basis. Legal warfare, or lawfare, if you want to call it. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is the specific case of Sepul uh, Sarko, of how the colonial dominance happens on women's bodies, right? And so the specific, this specific case of these women who were raped, they survived, they were not killed like the men, but they were raped, right? And the uh, specific intersection of indigenous women throughout the new world, colonization happening on their bodies, rape through violence, right? The, the dominance, conquest as rape of the land and of the women. And this idea, this case in particular, shows it how the modern state is constructed through violence in indigenous women's bodies. Right? It's a place where the state uh, establishes, imposes its presence. Then I wanted to make a point about uh, privilege in academia, which makes an uh, moved me a lot your point because I was uh, detained in Ecuador last year, last summer, for mm -hmm. doing activism, defending water rights with mm -hmm. the movement. I was beaten by the police for three minutes maybe. I was jailed for five days and then I was expelled because I'm privileged. Because Rigoberto Juarez stayed a year and eight months in jail, right? Oscar Sanchez is going to stay probably two years in jail, and so forth. Because they don't have PhDs, right? Because they don't have a social network. Because they're indigenous and defending their communities. They are within their communities with the land, with the rivers. And you can only be there to defend it, right? If you go to the cities, we were talking about it yesterday. If you go to the university in the city of Guatemala, you leave your territory. How do you defend the territory of the university? So there is an inherent contradiction about being indigenous on the land and being in academia, right? It's, it's a tension in and of itself. And one thing she says is that we have this privilege of being uh, in academia. She expressed hers, I'm expressing mine. I'm here expelled only and not in jail. And every time I went to see Roberto in jail, I left with a horrible guilt of being able to get out. And those who are inside don't know if they're going to get out, nor when they're going to get out. So what can we do from academia? And I think we have positions of power and our responsibilities to shout and to write and, and to talk about it, to make these invisible histories visible through theory, <coughs> by telling history, which is what Maya lawyers do, right? Asociación de abogados Maya tiene que explicar la historia de Guatemala a la final. Right, so rebuilding national history, rebuilding memory. Sepul uh, Sarko was about that to a large extent. And getting out of the ivory tower. So within the ivory tower we can, we have, we must do other theories right, from elsewhere for other purposes. 
And we must also get out of the ivory tower through journalism, through social movement, and through activism. And it's a responsibility that we have in Europe. <coughs> Um, now to go to the very interesting uh, presentation by Glad, it's very that we have to translate this concept. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take me six months to find it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to take me six months to find So first I just wanted to make a mention there, because it's really interesting how inheritance happens differently in different indigenous contexts, and it shows what indigeneity is all about. So just two examples that I had in mind recently, the Incas, like they had the dual system, so property and land inheritance happened within the genders. So women could only trans transmit property to their girls, and the fathers transmitted property to their sons. Mm -hmm. right, so it, it's another model. Then the Cherokees, I just said, because I'm researching indigenous marriage for my own case, which will take the American court. The Cherokees transmitted matrilineal land. So in the 1850s, a lot of settlers started to marry, I mean, before the 1850s, but the 1850s, there's a lot of white men who marry Cherokee women to have access to land. And so the Cherokees passed special regulations on marriage in the 1850s, but just for marriage between Cherokee women and white men, right? Because they were trying to acquire property and transform the system of property rights towards individual land and not collective land rights, right? So there's a community approach. So just two examples that make me think can be interesting to compare. And so your your analysis of the situation in Guatemala and right how which is beyond, but how do we how do we how not to fall into the binary and equality between the sexes right to property. And maybe the the main thing that comes to mind is how queer indigenous politics are mm -hmm. and how an indigenous perspective is fundamentally queer uh, all along the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the queer is right to <laughs> um, So indigeneity is queer because it challenges the state. It challenges the borders of the state, it challenges the, the, the unity of the state as a sovereign territorial entity. Mm -hmm. Um, and what you show shows that it's a very interesting um, point for political theory, right? To show how it's not just about women, right? It's not about bringing women in and redistributing rights to women. It's about breaking the system of individual property and and reinventing collective property, transmission of property and territory. At the end of the day, it's about territory, right? Um, So it's a, it's a very interesting project which she's doing because it shows how, um, I was trying to find out the words, um, indigenous politics are, in, inherit, like, are inevitably related to gender, right? to gender research, because to gender queer, I would say, in that it resists the categorization, uh, and not only the categorization of sexes, but the categorization of land. Right? And and an indigenous project of rethinking the land is an indigenous project to rethink the state. Mm -hmm. And maybe to close, why is indigeneity so interesting for political science? Because it thinks outside the box. It's a different way of approaching all political governance. It's like inventing a new color. If somebody tells you invent a new color, it's really hard because we've never seen one. And if we think, or if we are asked, or if we want, because we all want to invent a new political system, we don't know how to go about it. And the only place that knows a different political system really is indigenous. Yeah. It's been experienced and it's survived in complicated ways. And your example shows that how indigenous has been mixed in with the state and you know where machismo comes from, where the division of gender of sexes come from. That's another story. But the fact of the matter is that it's all entrelazado now. How do we break it? And it's not about breaking the genders and bringing gender equality. It's about breaking. The and inventing other forms of governance mm -hmm. and authority over land and with the land, not over the land maybe, but with the land. When we're thinking in, term, in times of climate change, this is a major question. Mm -hmm. and, and indigenous mm -hmm. perspectives are foundational and fascinating and stimulating uh, for political science history.
Eh, es un honor eh, estar aquí, escucharlas, eh, también un honor escucharlas ayer porque tuvimos este espacio en el seminario para platicar. Eh, so I'm very honored to be here, I think privileged to hear uh, uh, all the uh, contributions uh, from your work, uh, activist and research work. Uh, I will be very brief to, to build on what has been said already. Um, there are, I think, if we try to look at what is common from what I, what I uh, hear from the presentations, it speaks a lot about, it. you both invite us to rethink the categories we use, and not only the methodologies, a lot, when we discuss a lot of the colonial uh, uh, theories uh, or anti-colonial, we think of methodologies, but it is much more than that. You, you are inviting us to think about our positionalities, uh, but also of the many debates and how we frame uh, debates uh, around uh, rights, particularly concerning indigenous uh, women. So, and I think in both cases, in, in regarding methodologies and categories, you are inviting us uh, to go beyond the individual paths that we take in academia, but also in the way we think our link uh, as activists and researchers. So beyond uh, individualism as um, logic. Uh, and maybe a few uh, specific things regarding to both of your presentations. So I think that Irma, you left us with many questions. I think very important questions uh, that go beyond of uh, how we do research, what we need to do this kind of research, what is the impact for the researchers, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous. But I think it's also more than that, is how we think the impact of our research and what you mentioned when you were asking what we do beyond the book uh, after the thesis. And I think in the way students are prepared, we focus a lot on the methodology before the project, doing the project, producing it, but there's not much in accompanying the processes of linking it to a broader process and and making sure to evaluate the impact of what we do. So I think we left that part without sufficient attention in academia, and I think you are inviting, uh, you bring the questions to uh, rethink more profoundly the link between activism and academia. So what it really means in a system that is pushing for a very individual forms of research, and that worries, as you mentioned, about individual safety and not the safety of all the communities that are in uh, different situations of inequality. So I think that is a very important questioning. Um, and uh, also I think that brings the question of how to uh, change the ivory tower. So not just to how to go outside it, but what do we do inside it while we are uh, in it. So what can we change? Um, um, also, I think that it sh you show uh, how it is um, important to link academia not only to activism in general, but uh, what are the spaces of struggle. So, if you mentioned if the struggle is in courts, how, what is the impact of the academic work? How do we do that? Uh, how do we prepare ourselves? And, uh, in, with which broader goals in terms of um, impact. Uh, and concerning the presentation of uh, Gladys, I think that uh, I found it very interesting uh, the, your proposition about <coughs> thinking of the politics of desire mm -hmm. to go beyond uh, the politics uh, of rights. Uh, a lot of uh, the, the writings that have been done on indigenous women's struggles in the Americas have opposed individual rights, collective rights, and how indigenous women deal between these two. And I think that your, your contribution is very important uh, because you're inviting to use different concepts, different perspectives. And I think it's, it opens new ways of seeing the many strategies indigenous women may have in, 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 in their own terms. So how do they define the struggles are so uh, beyond the discourses that are being imposed through uh, academic writings uh, and also activist spaces that work in collaboration and solidarity. Um, 
So, um, and I think it's uh, and something something very powerful. And I, I think also is the going uh, your intention to go beyond the logic of exclusion inclusion, uh, mm -hmm. which is also another uh, way of how the narrative on uh, indigenous women's struggles has been shaped a lot. So individual rights, collective rights, and inclusion exclusion. Mm -hmm. So I think those are very strong uh, contributions that are. Uh, contribute to uh, and pushes us to think differently, to change our concepts, methodologies, but also rethink the way we think of ourselves as academic activists. So thank you very much for, uh, for your presentations. So maybe we'll leave some time for, I don't know if you have <coughs> questions right now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, Mike, I'm thinking that we should take a couple of, a few questions from the audience and then have to go back to the, Jose. No? Um, By all means. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this. Um, I'm going to ask in Spanish and in Spanish. Okay. Primero, es un gusto para mí. Yo soy una mujer guatemalteca, soy indígena, pero es un, tengo una admiración enorme por ustedes. Eh, y es un honor para mí poder oírlas hablar hoy. Eh, mis preguntas tienen más que ver con el tema que habló hoy en Malicia, porque eh, gracias. Me, wow, me quedé muerta con la presentación que está porque me, o sea, nunca jamás había pensado en nada de lo que se dijo de las formas en las que me presentó fue no, novísimo para mí eh, pero estoy escribiendo una tesis sobre los juicios 20 años después del conflicto ¿no? eh, y mi pregunta me interesa mi pregunta es mucho es el cambio los, los, los juicios se han dado por un cambio institucional, más institucional, o más por una pugna de la sociedad civil específicamente indígena. Es la organización esta, o una combinación de las dos. ¿Qué, qué cree usted que es más como el catalizador de, la, de, de, de los juicios, digamos, que se hayan dado ahora? Um, so, um, phrase this a little bit in English. Uh, thank you for being here. How it is an honor for me to be here as a Guatemalan woman. Um, not an indigenous woman, but I have so much admiration for these women and the work that they do. Um, I know from living in that country how hard it is to be a woman and how hard it is furthermore to be an indigenous woman. In this environment. So it's huge. Um, not easily she blew me out of the water with all that she said. It was quite amazing. Um, but I was asking because you have never thought about any of those issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have thought about it, <laughs> but not. <laughs> you, you know, I thought about this issues, but not, not in the way, in she, the way she presented them, right? Yeah. She, she, yes. she, she makes it about more than just a feminist struggle, or more than just a land struggle, or more than just, anyway. Um, but I was asking Irma about, I'm writing a thesis about the trials that are happening now, and basically my question was why now, right? Why 20 years after, what has made it possible? And, and I was wondering if she thinks it's more an institutional change, like a change in the Procurador General, Claudia Paz y Paz, or a civil society change, a change in the organization of the indigenous people as, <coughs> as like, opening spaces for themselves, more now. Other questions? Surely. Comments? Responses to questions, please. Um, I think I I wanna. I was very moved by uh, Irma's uh, talk about the, the position of activist activism and scholarship, and <coughs> and most of them resonated with uh, my my geography, my experience, how I ended up here, and my demons, my nightmares. And I was, I, I, I'm curious about how you think about the, the rest of the world that goes through similar types of uh, violence and acts of atrocity. And I'm just curious if you have, um, if you can tell us what Guatemalan experience uh, can tell the rest of the world. Like, well, I am, yeah. 
I'm, all, I'm interested in, in hearing your opinions about what Guatemala can teach us in other parts. Anyone else? Well, once. <laughs> okay. Respondan y de repente tenemos tiempo para hablar. I want to respond in, in, in Spanish. Okay. 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 Sí. Okay. Eh, gracias por tu pregunta. Los juicios no deben verse como algo 20 años después. Después de que se firman los acuerdos de paz en Guatemala, el 27 de, de diciembre de 1996, al, de 96, al siguiente año, 97, empiezan las organizaciones indígenas a construir el FAI sobre el genocidio. Y se empiezan a poner las primeras denuncias en los tribunales. Construir, el, eh, hacer que los tribunales aceptaran el juicio por genocidio fue 13 años después. Después de que se negaron y se sacó el, el, el juicio por genocidio fuera de Guatemala y se llevó a España. Cuando España da la orden para capturar a Ríos Montt y Ríos Montt y otros generales no pueden salir del país, es que los tribunales guatemaltecos se abren. Y deciden entonces empezar lo que significó llevar el juicio por genocidio. O sea, fue inmediatamente de firmarse la paz, por una sencilla razón. Más de 45 mil desaparecidos. Y las familias querían saber en dónde estaban los desaparecidos. Y además, más de 200.000 muertos, muchos de ellos que quedaron en fosas comunes. La gente quería saber en dónde estaban sus seres queridos. Por eso empiezan los juicios. Eso es una lectura. Otra lectura. Esto hay que verlo en el marco del movimiento maya de Guatemala, que empieza a, eh, a principios del siglo pasado en 1940, especialmente 44 y 45, cuando se construye la, la Constitución de 1945 y por primera vez se da salarios para pueblos indígenas en toda la historia y por primera vez se restituye algo en tierras. Cuando eso ocurre, empiezan a surgir liderazgos indígenas masculinos y ellos empiezan con una demanda de luchas por derechos indígenas. Este, este siglo, diríamos, tiene varios momentos del movimiento maya. Este momento actual tiene que ver con los juicios. No porque la sociedad civil sea más abierta, sino fundamentalmente porque es un proceso que ha madurado y que se han cerrado muchos otros espacios, dejando el sistema de justicia como un camino para tratar de poner precedentes de irrepetibilidad, o sea que no vuelvan a cometerse esos casos. Y eso, eh, brevemente, lo que me dijeron las señoras de Sar y las señoras de Sepúl Sarto, nosotros vivimos el infierno, fuimos al infierno y volvimos del infierno. Y no queremos que ese infierno lo vuelvan a vivir otros pueblos. O sea, esa es una muestra de irrepetibilidad de esos crímenes y con ellas también cuando llega la orden en 1988 de que van a cerrar los campamentos los seis campamentos el ejército decide hacer una fiesta ahí y dicen las compañeras que las hicieron matar los animales preparar la comida y luego sirvieron la comida se emborracharon y pusieron música y las llevaron a ellas para que bailaran con quienes las habían violado y quienes habían matado a sus esposos. Y una compañera me dijo, yo bailaba compañera y yo, no sabía, y yo lloraba y yo no sabía si yo bailaba y lloraba porque se había terminado el infierno o por lo que el infierno se llevó. Entonces los juicios son una muestra de, de ese dolor profundo que tuvimos. So, uh, thank you for the questions. <laughs> thank you for the questions. And uh, I want to just point out that the trials did not take place 20 years after the war, but that in fact, if they were immediately taken to court 
immediately after 1996-97 when the peace was uh, signed. And it is um, over this uh, genocide. Um, it was the court, it took 13 years for the court to accept these trials and they only accepted it once they were taken out of Guatemala and into Spain. And when Spain gave the order to capture Rilmont and then they were denied the, uh, the extradition, uh, that's when the courts finally opened uh, to discuss the question and genocides and were open to the trials. And why these courts, why these trials? Because uh, there were over five, uh, 45,000 people who disappeared <coughs> and the women wanted to know where they were and um, where, what had happened to them. But also over 200,000 people who had been killed and um, most of them lie in collective burial sites and they wanted to know where were the bodies buried. Um, so that's one kind of reading. Another reading that needs to complement this one is the long history of the Mayan movement. Um, in the Mayan movement, for example, we can see in 1944-45 when the constitution uh, was passed, that for the first time in the history they, uh, we received a salary, um, a, a paid amount for our labor, and, um, and some land uh, rent restitution, but it was still mostly a male-led struggle. Um, so the, indeed, the Mayan indigenous movement has had various moments, and so now we are focused on the court, not because the courts uh, or the civil society has opened to us, but because uh, we are in a more mature uh, spa state where a lot of doors have closed, but the courts have opened as one possible path. Um, and this is an issue about uh, and repeatability, that word doesn't exist, but non-repeating, uh, that these things cannot happen again because we live in, we live hell. We went to hell and came back. Uh, and um, basically this is a way for other people not to have to relive uh, what happened. And um, when the, in 1948, <laughs> So in 1988, um, when the six uh, military camps were closed down, the um, so they were closed, and then the military order to make a big party, and they order the killing of many animals, and the cooking of the food, and the feast, and and then after the food was served, they called the women that they had raped to dance with them mm -hmm. and to have a big party. And one of um, the compañeras said, I dance and I cry and I don't know why I cry. Do I cry because the hell is over or because of what it took? Mm -hmm. And that was that. And about your question, ¿qué puede enseñar Guatemala sobre esto? Yo creo que nos muestra que no importa qué pueblo haya sufrido genocidio. Todo pueblo que ha sufrido genocidio va a luchar porque, porque el genocidio se castigue. Y no importa qué tanto pase el tiempo. El tiempo, no, el tiempo no se mide por años cuando ha ocurrido genocidio. Ocurre por la magnitud del crimen en contra de la humanidad. Y la magnitud del crimen es lo que va a mover a los que sobreviven a buscar justicia. Y yo creo que el genocidio de Guatemala es una muestra también de los otros genocidios que han ocurrido en el mundo y que, que, se, que va a como reproducirse en la memoria social de quienes quedan con una enorme responsabilidad. Porque en los que sobreviven saben que sobreviven a costa del dolor de los que se fueron. Eso es lo que hace doloroso las naciones que enfrentan estos crímenes. Y por eso es tan difícil tan confrontativo dentro de los países, dentro de las sociedades, los países se polarizan precisamente por la magnitud de los perpetradores, por el poder que tenían y también por el poder que llegan a empoderar a aquellos que se han quedado y que van a luchar por, el, por la justicia. So genocide, um, I think that all genocide uh, will, people who have suffered genocide will always seek to uh, some punishment for it, no matter how long it has been, the magnitude of the crime is the nature of the magnitude of the crime that 
Cosa uh, to uh, look for this punishment. Uh, it moves the survivors to seek justice, not only in Guatemala, but this system is also reproduced in many societies, and uh, it reproduced uh, in also in the social memory. Um, and it is an enormous responsibility that we have to carry out when we seek punishment for genocide. And it is very, very painful, but it is also very divisive. It divides countries, it divides societies, because there is very many perpetrators, but there is also those who are empowered as survivors and that must carry out this responsibility and seek for um, punishment. Any further questions, comments, thoughts? Yo quería saber si algún lado lo podemos ver sobre el trabajo que se está haciendo en la este. Sí, 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 sí. Puedes leer lo que ha procesado en español. Sí, esto es parte de mi tesis doctoral y bueno, hizo falta muchas cosas más que decir, como la tensión entre propiedad y uso, y regímenes de identidad que se han inaugurado, este yo trabajo una serie de categorizaciones en términos de cómo este, las mujeres calculan eh, cómo heredan y quién, cómo, eh, cómo no se hereda eh, y que el sujeto de la política es, es, este, es una trama comunal, es un sujeto individual y por lo tanto asuntos de momento como los del machismo este, también eh, se presentarían en otro lugar, entonces creo que eso falta mucho más que aclarar, pero es un libro que mi tesis doctoral y que la olvidé traer, bueno, no, lo dejé en el Temuco porque está en un proceso de liberación de una machi en el sur de, de lo que es Chile, lo que ellos llaman el territorio este, Mapuche o el Mapu, entonces no, no pude traer más, lo dejé todo para allá, así que, pero voy a hacer todo para mandárselo a Emiliana y que me um, so yes, uh, the, obviously this is part of a longer project, it's part of my doctoral thesis and um, it deals with many issues such as the tension between use and property and also the calculations that women make in this process of inheriting or not inheriting the land and also thinking about the political subject as uh, something that uh, is necessarily communal in this communitarian weaving. Um, and it obviously has to address with issues of the machismo, but I didn't uh, bring my uh, dissertation, I left it, I didn't forget it, I left it in Temuco because they are uh, going through a process of liberating Amachi, and uh, this is in territory in Chile, in Mapuche territory. Um, but yeah, so it's a longer project, but she will be back to check. What, what I was going to suggest is that Eh, que tal, tal vez si, si lo podría mandar una copia y la tenemos junto con el video de, de la presentación eh, en, en el site del, del centro. The, 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 the video of this will be on the site, at the center site, and I'm suggesting that we can, if they, once they send us the papers, we can send those send together. I would like to say something. I don't wanna. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say the last word, but I, I wanna say something about the academic world. Uh, for me, the academia is a political, a political world. So powerful and uh, so just. So um, I think uh, a few people around the world have has the privilege. To, to enter the university. So I think we need to use this privilege in order to change and to save the humanity in the world. And uh, I believe that it's important to publish books, articles, but the most important is the connection with the reality. And for me, this is the, the most beautiful thing of the academia. 
I wanted to say something. I think that that's one of the important things about public universities. Um, and I, I, at teaching and doing research at UMass, I hardly think of myself as operating within an ivory tower. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should say. Um, I think I think that there are there that, and I also think in in response to something that Manuela said that um, that I think it's incumbent upon all academics, um, you know, it, it, but especially perhaps those of us who come from particular kinds of dispossessed, excluded, discriminated, uh, whatever communities to be also activists. But I think all of academia is, the, the biggest problem that academia has is its removal. Uh, it's, it's, and, and, this, and this idea that you go, that, that you're not trained to do the, re, to, to the give back, el, el retorno, mm -hmm. it, you know, and that's a big complaint um, with indigenous communities, with women's communities, with women's movements, with all kinds of social movements, with especially the most vulnerable people that are the objects of, of academic knowledge production. Um, so that, but that also has to do with, I don't remember, I think it was you who said it, changing the institution, because to do that, um, people either have to, have to make choices about compromising their careers, right? Um, well, of course not necessarily. Here I am, <laughs> for instance. You know, uh, yeah. uh, not necessarily at all. Uh, but and, and Irma has made. There lots of people have made that choice. But people do have to make a compromise. That is to say, um, the the academy expects still individual productivity, uh, focused research, immediate research results, things that don't lend themselves easily to colaboración con comunidades to you know, action-oriented research to long-term uh, observation and participation and, and feedback to communities and so on. You had something See, also. See, building on that in a way, um, I think that the other important piece of, of trying to engage in scholarship is what you give back to the community that you are researching with. Entonces, para vos, Gladys, te quería preguntar, porque para mí el problema no es solamente qué, qué posición tomamos nosotros frente al Estado, frente al poder, qué, cómo diseminamos lo que aprendemos, sino también cómo le devolvemos a la comunidad ese conocimiento que nosotros unearth, ¿no? que sacamos de la tierra de alguna manera, cómo se lo devolvemos. Porque tenemos casos, innumerable cantidad de casos, que eh, personas que escriben libros sobre una comunidad en inglés y después la, la, la propia gente ni siquiera los puede leer y pasaron horas y horas trabajando con ellos y los desposeemos de alguna manera de su voz, ¿no? Porque venimos y hablamos en nombre de ellos en estos espacios, ellos no vienen acá. And then my question was, how do we give back to the community that we research with? Is there a way that um, we can empower these people that we work with bring them to our own conferences, uh, uh, publish books in the way that they can also read them and collaborate. Es un poco. Mm -hmm. eh, muy buena tu pregunta. Yo, este, este texto es el quinto capítulo de una larga investigación después de una masacre ocurrida hace cuatro años. En eh, entonces, eh, justamente las comunidades opusieron a reformas constitucionales que modificaba el estatuto comunal de los sistemas de gobierno, eh, que aumentaba las tarifas eléctricas y que anulaba la carrera normalista. Entonces, eh, yo me pregunto, la pregunta de investigación es cómo a pesar de estas jerarquías y de estas eh, lógicas de poder, eh, las comunidades siguen siendo las únicas capaces de impedir la totalización del capital. Eh, y de la universalización del Estado. Entonces, en ese sentido, lo comunal es crítico y pone en crisis al, al Estado de eh, Entonces, yo construí una serie de, de preguntas, otra vez, cómo llegamos a ser lo que somos, y ahí me instalé en un discurso histórico de archivo para ver de dónde venía esta fuerza que parecía que era una gran fiesta, pero era una rebelión, pero era una... Este, un entierro de seis muertos eh, y ahí construyó este argumento digamos, de pensarlo comunal fuera de uso, tradición y costumbre y pensarlo como un sistema de gobierno 
Y, eh, y bueno, yo acabé el texto eh, y en paralelo comenzamos a trabajar varias compañías más en colectivos, eh, proyectos de fotografía para construir discursos e imágenes de la masacre, pero también de la masacre conectada con otras masacres que ocurrieron alrededor, porque mi pueblo no fue masacrado en los años 80, en el momento de la guerra, y también construyó un argumento que puede ser bastante problemático en términos de por qué Totonicapán no fue masacrado y por qué Siquiche y Bobetanango. Este... Entonces, eh, cuando yo acabé estos argumentos de una explicación sobre por qué la guerra pasa de manera diferente en territorios comunales del altiplano, de dónde viene la fuerza para responder contra la totalización del Estado y del capital y de dónde sacan la fuerza las comunidades para organizar un gran duelo colectivo para que todos lloremos tres días seguidos por nuestros muertos y después agarrar la fuerza para responder al Estado. Eh, pues ya escribí todo eso. Eh, y cuando la tesis se convirtió en libro, yo le pedí a las autoridades comunales que lo leyeran y que lo discutiéramos. Y la presentación de este libro fue en una asamblea de autoridades comunales en mi pueblo comentado por las autoridades comunales y yo con mucho miedo y nervio porque finalmente cómo uno le va a decir a las autoridades que ustedes hacen esto o eso y lo otro pero finalmente después de eso la verdad ya todo lo demás no, no me termina intimidando eh, entonces yo produje un, un, una discusión con, con mis compañeros con aquellos hombres y mujeres que cotidianamente organizan el cuido del bosque, el cuido del agua el cuido de los temascales eh, y terminamos todos con una gran fiesta al final de la presentación del libro. Entonces, eh, yo en primer lugar pensaba que el, el primer lugar donde yo tenía que presentar este texto era con mis compañeros. ¿Sí? crisis um, so but also I did a lot of archival research and um, to talk about this spirit of rebellion of feast this spirit of feast that then transforms into a rebellion or is it a rebellion um, and then I came to think of the community not so much as a space for traditions but also as a form of government in itself and this research also led me to produce um, research with image, uh, photography, connecting images, connecting discourses, connecting different massacres, because for example, this chapter that uh, is chapter five, mm -hmm. um, started after a massacre, but I wanted to connect this massacre to other massacres. Why uh, did it not happen in the 80s in my community in Totolican, but it did happen in with Tenango? Um, and so how to, um, these connections, these differentiations of what kinds of war happen to what kinds of community and why. Um, and so I understand that this can be a very problematic uh, argument, but uh, the response of the people, where does that strength come from? Where does uh, the strength come to have a collective mourning that can last three days? And where do we then take strength after those three days of collective mourning to stand up against the state? Um, and to talk about the community and the caring of the community and of the water and of the ceremonies. And after I finished the book, um, I took it back and we read it and we discussed it. And uh, to be honest, I was uh, quite nervous, but we did have at the end a, be a, a big feast. <laughs> No, este, creo que, que también el capítulo de las mujeres es, o sea, a mí siempre me ha disgustado esta como idea liberacionista que tiene cierto discurso feminista liberal de liberación de las mujeres eh, y el problema de la herencia comunal de la tierra es mi problema y es el problema de varias mujeres. Eh, y yo vi cómo mis tías gestionaron su vida eh, 
y vi las dificultades también. Eh, y entonces para mí este es el problema, es que la existencia del sistema de gobierno comunal que juega con propiedad de la tierra, pero la propiedad de la tierra por 200 años ha sido potentemente defendida por alianzas y patrimoniales. Y ahí hay, se juega una dificultad. Entonces, ¿qué significa erosionar el parentesco y no perder la tierra? Es la pregunta. Y es mi pregunta y es eh, la que me, me sigue devanando los sesos. Por lo menos ya pude construir una pregunta y no seguir pensando a la exclusión de las mujeres indígenas, sino en términos de inclusión diferenciada. Ahorita me sirve este término. Capaz de aquí a unos tres años después de que vamos a hacer unos talleres con las compañeras sobre estas ideas. Ampliar más allá de la propiedad que le busca enseñar en los talleres y a ver qué, qué sale. ¿no? Pero finalmente es mi problema y es el problema comunal también de muchas mujeres. Eh, en Ecuador, por ejemplo, yo hice investigación en Otavalo y en el Chimborazo y hay líneas parecidas o en la MIGE, este, las líneas de realidad que me cuentan mis compañeras MIGE también, digamos, atraviesa ese tipo de Uh, also, in this chapter, um, I was dealing with this uh, uh, image of the liberation of women, no? the liberation of women, it's also a liberal concept, and uh, my problem is not the liberation of women, but the inheritance of the land, that is my problem, and that is the problem of many women in the community, and I saw mostly how my aunts, for example, manage life, and this is the problem the, uh, about community government in itself, right? that at the same time it protects a property for a couple hundred years, but then at the same time that it protects this uh, property as territory, it also goes down through patriar patrilineal or patriarchal uh, forms of uh, processes. And so this is the issue with kinship, right? It's not, a, not about um, how to achieve uh, the protection of the land uh, without eroding the land. Uh, and doing this patriarchal structure. Uh, and that's why the term differentiating inclusion is uh, useful for me, at least for now, but it is, of course, uh, just a, a working temporary uh, concept. And the workshops, we're going to carry out workshops with these ideas, um, and the workshops are called Beyond Property, and we will see what these workshops uh, uh, will say. But uh, this is many women's problems, and not only in Guatemala, in Ecuador, also where I conducted research in Otavalo, this has been a problem and it is a problem elsewhere as well.